Jay Shore here, Jay the safety guy. Many of you know me as the partner, one of the partners of Shore Solutions, a national practice management consulting firm specializing in the operational, administrative, and financial health of medical practices. But many of you that have seen me before know me as Jay the safety guy. And I'd like to give you just a quick uh, couple of five, 10 minute opportunity to speak about what happens when we're returning to work. Uh, after this COVID-19 or during the COVID-19 pandemic. And chances are, as employers, you don't need the force, uh, the force of law to make you take care about the health of your employees, especially during this novel coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. But it's still important to know what the Federal Workplace Safety Agency, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, has to say about employees returning to their jobs with a measure of confidence in their own safety. So let's get after it. OSHA's recent guidance on preparing workplace safety for COVID-19 reports that they want to offer to help a blueprint. However, the agency stresses it's only advisory in nature. They can't make you do it. You have to have one yourself, and it doesn't set any new standards. Also, if it falls under the underlying laws of overall requirement that employees provide their own, uh, employers provide their own employees with a workplace that's free from recognized hazards, that they're likely to cause death or serious illness of harm. That's normal anyway. So what I want to speak about are some points from OSHA, the OSHA blueprint to help you consider workplace safety throughout the new lens, the new normal, which I'm actually going to call the normal. So the first thing is we need to assess a risk profile. Step one in working towards a hazard-free workplace is to make sure that infectious disease preparedness and a response plan, OSHA states, you might need to recycle your old plan that wasn't working or you may not have even had a plan before. Anyone that's ever heard me speak always hears me speak about having a plan because when you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. And you have to have a plan at some future time when another more aggressive virus makes the rounds. And man, I certainly hope not. Consider the sources of COVID-19 that workers might be exposed to those that include both sources at work, namely co-workers and other people who regularly come to your workplace, come to your, your, your medical practice, come to your med spa and your staff's potential exposure even outside of your office. For example, employees who commute to work via public transportation or might carpool might face a higher risk of being exposed than those who drive their own cars. And similarly, employees with spouses or family members who work on the front line, such as hospitals, clinical settings like you, could pose a greater risk than others. Well, while you can't discriminate against employees who might be off to a greater risk than others, having a complete risk exposure picture can guide your overall preparedness strategy. And you might have considered that the chances of a viral outbreak at your workplace were minimal before, but thinking about potential infectious, infectious and indirect sources of exposure, and thus you might decide to take greater precautions than you would other might otherwise have done so. I've always said, you know, prepare for the unexpected, and now we have to prepare for the next expected, hoping it doesn't happen. So workplace control categories. Workplace controls for infection prevention, as OSHA calls them, fall into four buckets. Number one, engineering controls. Physical measures that include high efficiency filters, HEPA filters, increased ventilation, and installing physical barriers such as clear plastic sneeze guards, sneeze guards that you see now in banks, you see them at Costco. Number two, administrative controls. This involves HR policy, safety equipment, and procedure training. Number three, Safe work practices, for example, include no touch trash cans. You know, the one that you put your foot on them or when you come near them, there's an infrared or a light beam and it opens the can by itself. Alcohol-based hand rubs and required hand washing. Ha required hand washing after each and every patient and let the patient, that's the next patient, make sure that they see you. Number four, personal protective equipment, PPE. 
This includes gloves, goggles, face shields. And, you know, while there's no COVID-19 specific OSHA PP standard, some regulations may apply here. One is general industry PPE standards laid out in what they call 29 CFR 1910 subpart one. That's the federal code of federal regulations that OSHA governs. And it governs when the use of gloves, eye face, and respiratory protection is required. As the four categories indicate that I just mentioned, infection prevention measures highlighted by the OSHA aren't limited to frequent hand washing and disinfecting of workplaces. They cover work policies that you might not already have in place, for example, when employees should work from home or call in sick. Uh, while it isn't suggested by OSHA, you might want to review your paid sick leave policy to ensure that it doesn't discourage sick employees, potentially with COVID, to report to duty to avoid forfeiting pay. People are going to be unhappy not wanting to come into work, all right, because they're afraid, but they're not going to want to not come in because they don't want to get paid. They don't want to not get paid. Other possible policy measures to consider include staggered work shifts. So some people come in in the morning, some people come in in the afternoon. And what that does is lowers the density of the employees at work at any one given time and other ways to allow workers to spread out more. In other words, social distancing, employees' obligations. Your employees should be informed on what right the person or department has to contact them if any symptoms for you, them to contact you, should be consistent with COVID-19 if they arise. And what will happen next? Ideally, you should have multiple options ranging from sending the employee home immediately to moving the employee's workstation to a more uh, remote site, almost like mazing, making some reasonable accommodations. Although most work sites do not have specific isolation rooms, designated areas with doors may serve as an isolation room until potentially sick people may be removed from the workplace. And we're almost finished now. Not every respiratory infection is COVID-19 related, of course, but OSHA discourages employees from requiring every sick employee or any sick employee to obtain documentation from a healthcare professional before deciding how to handle the situation. Erring on the side of precaution and erring on the side of caution is probably the best practical solution because swamped medical offices may not be able to generate such documentation. Now there's a risk pyramid. OSHA's guidance also features a risk pyramid that classifies hazard levels for different kinds and different kinds of jobs in your office. It's encouraging to note that OSHA believe that most workers will likely fall lower than the medium exposure risk level. So jobs with medium exposure risk include that that require frequent and or close contact with people that may be affected but are not known or suspected to be infected. And the least risky they are, the least riskier jobs that are those that do not require contact naturally with people. And what they're known to be or suspected of being infected nor in frequent contact, contact with the general public. In contrast, jobs with very high exposure risk includes healthcare workers like us and those who perform different types of known work or work with suspected COVID-19 patients. The next level down in the risk spectrum are jobs with just high exposure risk. And this includes healthcare delivery personnel, for example, ambulance drivers and medical support staff working around known or suspected COVID-19 patients. In final thoughts, as noted, the Occupational Safety and uh, Health Administration OSHA's, OSHA's suggestions are merely just that. They're suggestions, suggestions that are not strict requirements. It's helpful to read the OSHA guidelines to ensure that you're aware of how can, uh, contagion spread, but for your company, you and your trusted managers and advisors are in the best position to evaluate the risks that exist in your workplace and how to minimize them. So I hope Jay, the safety guy, has given you a little bit of something to look forward to in order to make a plan in your workplace. And until then, please stay safe. <laughs>